Hey, patrons. Thank you so much for all the continued support. It means a lot to me. And I am done. Okay, so I just finished up listening to The Last Argument of Kings by Joe Abercrombie. This is the final book in the First Law Trilogy, and I want to give you my unedited thoughts upon finishing this book, which was just right now. So this is not my first time uh, reading slash listening to this book. Um, I had listened to this a couple years ago, um, and I declared at the time that it was one of my favorite fantasy books of all time, certainly one of my my favorite um, audio narrations of all time. And while I still do feel like the audio narration is as good, if not better, uh, than what I remembered it, I got to be honest with you. Um, I'm, I don't, I didn't like this book as much as I did the first time. Now I loved it. Um, I loved my reading of this. It's still one of the better books that I've ever read. Um, you know, it's definitely going to show up in my top hundred, definitely out of my top 50, you know, higher than that. It's, it's probably my favorite first law book. And I love the first law. The first law is one of my, I, I think like my, my third favorite fantasy series of all time. But I didn't like it as much because of how much I liked it the first time. When I first read it, I thought it was one of my first, my favorite, like, top five or ten favorite books I've ever read. And honestly, I don't know that it's that much better than the rest of the First Law books. I think the First Law books, especially the the trilogies, are kind of interchangeable with how good they are. They're fantastic writing. But this one doesn't stand out like I remember it. Um, now, I, you know, I, I, I'm... While I didn't like it as much, I got to just be, I I do have such strong feelings of positivity here, but on my TBR contest, I'm pretty sure zero people thought I would say that I liked it less, but it's honestly just because of how much I liked it the first time. So uh, I'm going to go into all the details here, but before I go into all those details of this book, I'd like to talk very briefly about the sponsor of this video, uh, Atlas VPN. So if you've watched a lot of my videos, you know that I don't run a lot of ads, um, and that's not because I don't get offers. It's because that I will only do ads for companies that I personally use, uh, which is the case for Atlas VPN. So uh, Atlas is the best VPN deal in the market, coming in at just $1.83 per month, which is ludicrously no if you know how much VPNs cost, um, plus three months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So click the link down below in the description or scan this QR code uh, to save 85%. Now, you might be wondering, why would you ever need a VPN? Um, now, here's some quick examples of why you might want to use one. So let's say that you have Netflix and you want to watch Friends or Big Bang Theory or Brooklyn Nine-Nine or Rick and Morty or a series of other, fa- uh, other series, uh, but they aren't there because they're not available in your country. Well, Problem solved. Uh, Go grab some fish and chips because you now live in London where they are available. Uh, Let's go another example. Uh, Let's say you want to book a hotel in Dubai uh, and you aren't getting the discount that other people might have available to them. Problem solved. I hope you like living in a tall building because you now live in New York City. Enjoy saving a couple hundred. Uh, It also keeps your Google searches private, uh, stops ads and malware, and protects all of your devices. So, again, click the link down below in the description to save 85% on Atlas VPN, and you can go ahead and thank me later. So, let's go back into this book. Let's talk a little bit about this series as a whole. So, The First Law is this grim, dark kind of series, and I know that Joe Abercrombie doesn't want to call it a grim, dark book, uh, but but it very much is. And by that, I mean there's not a lot of hope here. It's just constantly a little bleak, and you don't really have a lot of positivity into hoping that the ending is this nice ending where everything's going to work out. It's not like that at all. Um, it's gritty. It's a lot of bad people in this, a lot of gray people, very, very, very few truly good people. I mean, one of the best people in this book from like a morality standpoint um, is a violent, violent killer. Um, And I'm talking about uh, Logan Ninefingers. And, you know, there are some people that try to do good things. I mean, one of them violently attacks um, a family member of his. Um, And that's probably one of the better characters in this series. Uh, It's just kind of how this series is. And I love it for that. I mean, and and so, but this series kind of goes down this path and it's setting stuff, stuff up. Um, where not a ton happens in the first book. A lot more happens in the second book, but not like a ton. Now, a lot more happens in the third book because all the dominoes have been set up, and now Abercrombie's going to go through and start knocking them down, tell you where this story is going, where it went, and just really the nice conclusion here that we're kind of hoping for that kind of wraps up all of these different things. And while that does happen, you know, it's not... the, The surprises here, they worked. 
Um, I liked them. It was very nice uh, uh, doing a reread of these books because you can kind of see all these things getting set up that you didn't see previously. Um, but John Abercrombie's genius here is the way he writes. It's the characters. It's the dialogue. That's where this series shines. And it doesn't need this third book to be able to shine because it, it's been shining all of the way through. Um, so I can't really say too much about the plot here other than in general, we're talking about a single kingdom, the people within it, and a major conflict that, that kingdom is going through from seemingly um, a, an outside force of uh, a foreign country and an outside force of these like, like wild men people trying to deal with both of those major conflicts happening at the same time with a lot of deaths, you know, the monarchy and in a struggle um, and these major things going on all the while following, you know, a small handful of POV characters, um, you know, there's like four or five main ones. Um, and that's the story. It, it's not, you know, certainly not like a top 10 story by any means. Um, but the way it's written is genius. The way it's written is, truly like God tier on, on the quality that a book could be. And now I, obviously writing quality is very subjective, right? I mean, there's no truly perfect writing style. It works for some people and it won't for, work for others. It's an art form for this guy. That art form succeeds uh, in spades. I mean, when I read what he writes, not only do I bounce between these moments of seemingly very poignant, life lessons that are taught to me in a very exquisitely written way, bouncing between laughing, uh, like audibly laughing at the hilarity of these different moments um, that are not jokes. They're often these dark moments that happen, um, but, you know, funny nonetheless, to bouncing between, you know, brotherly love uh, b between, you know, very bad people and these major themes that constantly are, are, are thrown out there um, about character growth and the struggle of growth and can people really change the way they are and becoming a different person um, and, and how hard that is for different people, um, you know, how much you can trust people, just huge range of human emotions that are just poured out here from the soul of Joe Abercrombie. Um, that just speaks to me in such a vivid way. And, you know, I do like a darker story. I find that it can be more realistic. I, I find, and I don't like to be a pessimist, but, you know, the world has a lot of bad characters in it. I, I find that there is, is a lot of good characters as well, but, you know, there, there, are no, there is no perfect person out there. Everyone has their own demons. And to try to pretend that that doesn't exist and that there are these perfect people out there is, uh, is a fallacy. And Joe Abercrombie, you know, goes in that other direction where he kind of shows that, you know, is there any good in the world? And, you know, I disagree with that. But I'd much rather have it this way than this goody two-shoe type of writing um, that some other authors might go down where it's either, you know, very bleak, dark, horrible people battling against very good, perfect characters and that you know the good guy is going to win. You know, in here you have um, a lot of people that are trying to do the right thing, but ultimately that's very that's a lot harder, right? I mean, I find that in my own life, right? I mean, I, I, you probably find that in your own life where it, it's very hard to be a good person sometimes. Uh, and the choices that you have to make in life are always not easy, uh, are not always easy. And, um, and I love that and the themes that are written about here. Uh, you know, the characters themselves, I find just as good as the writing quality. Um, you know, there's characters that I think are gonna be very high up, very high up on people's list of favorite characters of all time. If they were to read this series and a host of other series, you're gonna constantly hear people like, like Glockta, the torturer. Um, you're gonna hear people like Logan Ninefingers, this uh, wild man, uh, former leader that is trying to, you know, carve a new path. Uh, you're going to constantly hear people like Baez, the mysterious mage, um, or people like Giselle, this pompous, um, you know, silver spooned character that uh, that sees himself in a very different light than than the way that others see him. And they all feel so different. And it's not, I'm not just talking about the point of view characters, uh, even the side characters here down to a very small side bit character that would be like on the D list in terms of the showtime that these characters get in the series feel like 
there is a lot of heart and soul poured into these people to make them very unique. Now, this is all amplified, greatly amplified by the genius level of audiobook narration done by Stephen Pacey, who I believe is the greatest audiobook narrator uh, that I've ever heard. Now, I'm not going to sit there and say that everything he's done is great, because the only thing that I've listened to uh, has been the first law. But I've listened to now uh, a couple hundred audiobooks, and nothing is better than what Stephen Pacey does. There are other people that do uh, sim close, um, but nobody that gets to this level how he's able to bend his voice around into so many different characters and make them so terribly unique with not relying on, you know, ethnic stereotypes to make differences, to make them truly different, how he's able to make his voice sound feminine uh, for the different uh, woman characters in the series. Um, and, and so unique and iconic that if he were to, years down the line, if I never listen to this again, which I'm sure I will reread this constantly throughout my life, um, but if I didn't, if I just heard him utter one word, I would know exactly uh, what character spoke that and the feeling and the emotion that was gone into that. It's, it's that incredible. So, I mean, I, I honestly think that if you've read this book in a physical format that you're missing out and that you ought to go back and reread this in an audiobook format. And if you haven't read this, then you, sh you know, if, even if you don't listen listen to audiobooks, this is the one to do it with, even if you can't listen very often. I mean, this is not a terribly uh, complicated series. Uh, there's not a ton of named characters. The plot doesn't get too out of sorts. This would be very easy to just casually listen to 10 pages a day and not get lost um, and just soak up how the quality uh, that is unsurpassed. Um, you know, I, I think that the, the world building here is, while a little more isolated, we get to go to several different areas of this world, but, you know, 90% 90, 90 of this book is dealing with the same, you know, basically the same city, um, but it feels rich. I mean, the, the different places you get to go to, while they don't feel terribly different, I mean, you get a major city, and then you get, you know, these woodsy areas up in the north, and some small amount of time in another city, and some time in the second book dealing with like a journey, and like kind of an abandoned uh, kind of continent with a lot of ruins and the like. Um, so nothing terribly unique, but it does feel like it comes to life. Um, you know, the magic here is extremely muted. I mean, we, we get some, there's magical elements here. Uh, you know, there's magical beasts here, but it's very much in the background. I mean, you've got basically one character that can do magic in this series. Uh, some others as well. I, I shouldn't say that, but one, one character that is predominantly the, the mage of the group. But the rest of them are just people living in almost like a medieval setting. Um, so you could take out all of the magic out of the series and it wouldn't ruin any of the series at all. It would, it would have the same life to it. Um, you know, so it, it's not going to get like high scores for some unique magic system or something. It's totally a soft magic system that you're not supposed to understand. It just is kind of there. Um, but it does add some flavor to this. Um, so all in all, what a wonderful book. What a wonderful series. Um, and I'm so looking forward to going and reading the rest of these six books. Um, I have three standalone books to read. And the standalones were my least favorite of the series. But I have a different perspective on Abercrombie, I think, now. And I think I'm going to like them a lot more than I did originally. And, oh, man, I can't wait to read that last, the second trilogy. Because I, when I originally read it, I found this, the trilogy, the second trilogy, to be better than the first. Which I think is a little bit of a controversial opinion. Uh, most people love the second trilogy, like the first. But most people say the first one's better. Um, and I wonder if I'll say that because of how much that I've really appreciated this first one. I mean, as I'm reflecting on it, I definitely like the first and second books more than I originally did. And that's because... I really liked them, but they, I felt like they paled in comparison to the third book. So those two elevated for me um, quite a bit, and the third one kind of went down a little bit to where they're all three in the same zone now. And so I, I wonder what those last three will be like. I can't wait to find out and to go through that adventure with you. Um, and I would encourage anybody that is okay with some darker themes to their story uh, to delve into this story headfirst. I mean, you should just swim into this book like Scrooge, McDuff and, uh, Scrooge McDuck and his gold pile. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful journey, and I hope that you will take it. So uh, that is it for me. Thank you so much for watching this review, and as always, happy reading to you. Thanks again to all my patrons with a special shout-out to my Ascendant Tier and Librarian Tier patrons, Anna G, CJ, Darren, Gregory, Jonathan, My Book is Lit, Nathan T, Nev's Book Channel, Orthodoxia, Ron Reich, Russell, Ryan L, Sydney Baker, Tahir, Anna, Andra, Angelo, Blair, 
Brock, Evan, Harry B, Joe, Cat Mick, Maria, Michael Sugarman, Sky, TW57, Wacky, and Zion. Thanks for sticking to the end of this video, and if you want to watch some more content from my channel, click over here and I've got some good videos for you. Thanks so much.